We have shared in song this morning about the holiness of God. And the only thing that really makes us want to change is the grace of God that He gives to us. God elected and chose to, um, to offer salvation for us before He ever created the world, before the foundation of the universe. And God knew at that time, before He ever created us, that we would sin. He knew what Adam and Eve would do. He is an all-knowing God. And yet He is a gracious God as well. And He, he chose to go ahead and create us anyway. And He chose to place upon us the the opportunity to be able to have a relationship, to be restored with Him through Christ. And so we have learned some lessons from Abraham, and one of those is that God is a holy and a sovereign God. God knows what we will do before we ever do it. And yet, in that sense, God still demands for us an accountability of sin. We will stand before Him one day, thankfully for believers that Christ has taken the condemnation of our sin. He has paid that price. But each one of us is going to stand before Him and give an accounting for the quality of life that we've lived for Him. So we are accountable to God. The Bible says very plainly in Proverbs 16, 5, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And I am grateful today to know that in the sense of my guilt, in the sense of all that I've done, that Christ, Christ bore the price for that. That causes for me great joy, but it also it causes great sorrow in my heart to know that everything that I've done and the things that I have made the choice to do in sin, knowing good and well what it costs, that Jesus died for me. Romans 14, 12 says, <coughs> So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Hebrews 2, 3 says, How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. There is no doubt in my heart that we deserve to be judged in our sin. But the second part of that verse, For all the wages of sin is death, but, aren't you glad that's in there? But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ our Lord. So we know that God is a holy God. God is a sovereign God. But I want to declare to you today, the truth that God is not fair. I know that there are a lot of people that look at things that God does and they say, oh, well, that's not fair. Well, I want to say it. God is not fair. Because in fairness, I deserved to be cast into eternal judgment from the moment that I was born. I was born with a nature of sin. And as I grew and as I matured, that nature became more evident and I deserve to be judged. I don't want God to be fair. I don't want God's justice. I want His mercy and I want His grace. And God is a merciful and a gracious God. Romans 3 and verses 3 and 4 says, What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. King James says, God forbid. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it's written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. God is not fair. He gives mercy. Mercy is where God withholds from us what we truly deserve. And God is gracious. God gives us unmerited favor, something that we could never buy, something we could never live up to, something that we could never deserve. And so we learn these lessons from the Scripture, that, that God has brought that news to us. We learn these lessons from the Holy Spirit as He draws us to the Lord. But God has given us a gift to be able to go back and look in the Old Testament and see these truths lived out in those Old Testament heroes of the faith. And Abraham is one that lives this out and teaches us that God is uh, a God who gives to us, He gives to us justification. Bible calls that as well imputed righteousness. 
In uh, Genesis chapter 15, in verse 6, it says that Abraham believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. God gives us mercy. He gives us grace. And he takes what Jesus has done on the cross and he takes all of the righteousness of Christ. And when we believe In Christ, when we surrender to Him, at God in His grace and goodness, that He takes the righteousness of Christ, He has taken our sin and cast it upon Jesus' account, and He takes the righteousness of Jesus and He deposits it on our account. And we are made right with God by what Jesus has done for us. And God has accepted that substitutionary death. We're going to understand, and when we get a little bit further, we're going to see Abraham as he offers up his son. God has told him to take his son to the place that he will show him and to offer him as a sacrifice before God. Uh, several, several months ago now, uh, we were in church, and we had similar to what we had this morning, a baptism service at the very beginning. And one of my grandsons that will remain anonymous, uh, Luke said, he was sitting by um, his aunt, and he got all excited whenever Papa came down in the water. He can call me Papa. I'm Brother Dale to y'all. He's pa- I'm Papa to him. He said, oh. And she said, what, what, what's wrong? He said, Papa going to sacrifice somebody. <laughs> he got his words mixed up. Can you imagine when Abraham was called to sacrifice his son, the son of promise, and we'll look forward to that. It paints for us a beautiful picture of what God has offered through the true sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus himself. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 4 and verses 3 and following says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages is not, is not credited as a favor, but is what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. If you were to say that we could do anything, and anything um, that we could do would add to our salvation or cause our salvation or, or take part in our salvation, all he calls us to is believe. I know that there are some who think that you, you have to live a good enough life. Well, you cannot live a good enough life because we've all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God. Now, you could compare yourself to me. You might come out okay. You might say, well, they both sinned, but he hadn't come short of the glory of Dale. You, you might could say that. But it's like, it's like two vagabonds that lay out in the, in the gutter and measure themselves. Which one has more mud on them? Which one is longer in the gutter? Which one? It doesn't matter. We're all unclean. We're all sinners. We're all born in that way. Jesus took that upon himself. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. It is the grace of God, the song we just heard. It is by God's grace that is the only thing that makes me want to change. That, that comes to life that I might die to my sin. You've seen the picture this morning of baptism that we died to our sin and it was buried. But Jesus raises us up to be a new creature. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and following. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not as a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that, he, so that we would walk in him. We're not saved by our good works, but once we're saved, we want to live under the reign of God. He is our Savior, but he is also our Lord. We don't use that word Lord very much, but except to God. But every child understands when somebody says, who's the boss? 
And every one of them, if you go into their household and say, who's the boss, what are they going to say? Mama, that's right. She is the boss. Daddy's the boss. If they go somewhere, older sister gets to, or older brother gets to be the boss. We all know what it means to have a boss. Jesus is my boss. He calls the shots in my life. I'm surrendered to him as my Savior, but also as my Lord. We learn that through the life of Abraham and all those Old Testament saints. Now, does that mean that everything that we do, that we stay in step all the time? Nope. And God tells us that whenever Abraham messes up, uh, we know that he goes down into Egypt, lies about his wife, and uh, he gets in all kind of trouble. Anytime you go back to the old world, it's going to bring problems to you. But our faith sometimes does falter. Aren't you glad that God never falters? He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And even in those times, and even in the times when God is silent to us, then God never fails us. And sometimes we grow afraid, and fear causes us to, to think that we've got we to do something. Sometimes the best thing you can do is wait. And Abraham had to learn that the hard way because there were times in his disobedience that he tried, okay, God, you need a little help here. Let me help you out here. And this promise you've given me, God, this isn't, my goodness, we've waited. It was from 75 was when he left his uh, hometown, and he was 100 whenever his son of promise was born. 25 years? Waited 25 years for this promise? And there were times whenever he tried to take over and at one point waited 13 years before he ever heard from God. Now we're about to enter into a, a, an understanding that Abraham's going to help us to understand that God fulfills his promise. Last week we looked at a, a way that through Abraham's learning more about God that we learn more about God. He already knew God as Elohim. He knew him as the creator God. That's the God he worshipped when he was in the land of the earth with Chaldeans. But whenever God called him out, he worshipped the one true God. He didn't worship the gods of the Mesopotamians. He worshipped God, the one true God. So he already knew who God was. Now how was that revealed to him? Because he went out at night and he looked and he saw the stars. He saw a sunrise and he saw, he saw the mountains and he saw the beauty of nature. This morning, as, uh, as the choir, as the um, praise team was rehearsing and kind of getting everybody's mics set and all, uh, Jack and I sat down here and we were talking about, and I asked him, what does, what does some, something being holy, what does that mean? And so we talked about holy. Holiness is what's set apart for God and only God. God's the only one. He is holy. But things and people become holy whenever we are set apart for God. All the tabernacle, all the instruments in the temple, those places become holy. We learned that through Abraham. Because Abraham had the right relationship with this world. He, uh, he moved out of his homeland in the comfort of that. And what does he do? He is a sojourner for the rest of his days. He lives in tents for the rest of his days. He's not tied down here to this earth. And, and we have the truth that whenever he got there that he built an altar. He, he had a right relationship of who God is. But he had a greater revelation of understanding of who God is as he lives. We ought to as well. Hebrews 1 does tell us that God has revealed himself completely through his son Jesus. But Abraham learned that God was not only Elohim, but he was Adonai. He was that God, the Lord Almighty, ruler to whom everything is subject. He learned also that God was El Elyon whenever he encountered Melchizedek. And, and that means the, uh, the mighty one. It means that he understood that this Lord Almighty is the sovereign God. And then last week we talked about El Shaddai, that he is the almighty, all-sufficient, tender, caring God who has his hand on everything. We're about to move into the story of some pretty heavy lifting. Uh, we're going to come into the story where God, and we're going to examine where God gives this covenant and the details of the covenant to Abraham that will be lived out and still being lived out and will be lived out to the end of time. And we're going to understand the sign of that covenant that God gives to Abraham uh, is circumcision. And that that is a sign of the covenant. It is a 
physical reminder of the covenant. I've got a little cartoon uh, that it supposedly is Abraham looking up to heaven and he said, okay, the Arabs get the oil and we have to do what? That is for us not just a physical reminder. It is a spiritual reminder that God has set his people, he has set them special. Now, because of their disobedience, I don't believe that the church is the new Israel. I don't believe that we are the new chosen people. We are chosen, but we haven't replaced Israel. God's covenant is still true for Israel. He has set them aside for a time. But at the end of time, there's going to be 144,000 evangelists from the 12 tribes that are come to realize that Jesus is the Messiah. And there, and there will be millions who will come to know him. God is still going to fulfill. And whenever Jesus comes back and there's a millennial reign, that he will establish all the land that he has promised to them, that they will have the fulfillment of that promise. God's not finished with this or yet. So we're going to learn about the covenant and about the sign of the covenant. We're going to come to a time that we're going to see heavy, the, the judgment of God upon Sodom and Gomorrah and what takes place. We're going to understand about, and Abraham's going to have another failure. He's going to have a time where he's making deals with the world. Even, even in the times that were great, he still messed up. We better pay attention or we will too. God teaches us that. And then we're going to see the birth of Isaac. It's just a wonderful story. But next week, John Alvin's going to be here from the Dream Center, and I've invited him to come and to preach, and he's going to share uh, good news with us, uh, but also help us to understand some of the ministry that we're involved in and that you can be involved in. And then after that, the next week will be Labor Day. So after Labor Day, we're going to get back into the story of Abraham. But I want to pull out one portion of uh, the revelation that Abraham helps us to understand about God. This would probably be something I would normally not give a whole lot of attention to, but I need this. I don't know if anybody else does, but I need this. And I do believe that every one of us will gain from this. God is a holy, righteous God. This morning, I want us to visit the God who is the God of laughter. Now, I don't know about you, but normally, whenever I think of God, I, I don't think about laughter. Um, but God laughs. God has a wonderful sense of humor. We are created in the image of God. All that we are, the good parts of us, should reflect that we are image bearers. And one of the ways that I deal with stress one of the ways that I deal with uh, uncomfortable situations, I find, I find comfort in humor. Now, in school, that got me in trouble uh, all the time because I could find something that I thought was funny about almost any situation. God, if you don't have the view that God has a sense of humor and if you do not have the view about God being the God of laughter, then your view of God is distorted because God is a holy, a just, a righteous, but he is a good God. And he finds joy in himself. And God finds laughter about, about the joy that, that we bring to him. Um, I, I'm, I'm a, a bit, oh, it's obvious. I love my grandchildren. Uh, and I, I am proud of my grandchildren, and I am grateful for them. But my grandchildren, when I look at them, I want to laugh. I want to smile. I want to enjoy them because that's what life is for me, is for me to be able to enjoy living for Jesus. And I laugh about that. Why in the world would God want somebody like me? He must have a sense of humor. Please don't say amen. Um, I do believe Jesus told us that unless we come, Mark chapter 10, unless we come with as a small child. Well, what does a child, well, that's talking about trust. I know that, that a child is able to trust. They, they haven't come to the place where, where they are, you know, they're marked by the world in so many ways. They haven't come to that reality. So a child does trust and a simple trust. And that's how we come to Jesus. But what else about a child? A child laughs. And they, they're not restricted by 
by the things that we may, we may keep inside of us, a child laughs. And in that, sometimes a child will make you laugh. I do believe that as we come uh, to the story, just, just uh, how would you imagine Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus? You know him? Jesus is going around Jericho, and he's on his way, and he looked, and Zacchaeus, y'all remember him? He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. What did he do? Jesus was coming, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. I, I could write a song about it. Um, what does Jesus do when he gets up there? He can't see, so he climbs up to see Jesus. And when Jesus looks at him, he says, Zacchaeus, come on down, for I'm going to your house today. And whenever they got to his house, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and everybody hated Zacchaeus. I mean, they hated. The, uh, the Romans despised him because he was a Jew. The Jews despised him because he was working for the Romans. Nobody liked him. And yet, whenever he came in a contact with Jesus, Jesus did something to him. And he said, Lord, if I, I'm going to give half of my worldly goods, I'm going to give it away to the poor. And if I have cheated somebody, if I've defrauded them, then I'm going to repay them four times over. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, surely salvation has come to this house today. Do you think Jesus had this sad, somber look whenever he heard that and whenever he said it. I see Jesus as a smile as from ear to ear comes across Jesus' face and he looks and he sees the change that's happening in Zacchaeus and he says, surely salvation has come to this house today. Isn't it wonderful to think about Jesus? And Jesus had a great sense of humor. Um, you just think about some of the things Jesus said and put children in the mix when they first heard it. Jesus said, you know, talking about the hypocrites, and he said, you're trying to remove a splinter out of the eye of your brother when you've got a two before in your eye. And that mental image came across, and I could just hear the chuckles of the children as they imagined that, as they can almost draw the cartoon of that uh, in, their, in their head. I believe Jesus had a great sense of humor. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 17 that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Some of us today, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Not now, not, not right now, but sometimes that is the most spiritual thing you can do, that you need some rest. But every one of us needs a good laugh, but laughing for the right reason. I don't know why it is when something funny happens in a place where you're not supposed to laugh, where, matter of fact, it's going to be an appearance of uh, irreverence, or when you're a child, it means you're going to get in trouble. And when something happens, that is the funniest thing. And it may not really be all that funny, but if you can't laugh about it, if you're in church and something happens and you get tickled, then it is so funny. I I've thought of several most of them I cannot share <laughs> of what happened in church. A couple things that have happened in that setting. Uh, I went to a funeral at Gulfport, and uh, the man who was part of Grace Memorial's dad had passed away, and his dad was Catholic. And so I had not been to a Catholic funeral. And so whenever we got there and we sat down, there were five or six of us that went, and we sat down in the back, and there was a, a family that came in, and you could tell that they were members there, that they were Catholic, and this was their, their church. And, uh, and so you had the daddy and the mama, and then the children were just stair-stepped down. They had, I think, four children, and then mama was holding one of the children, was in her arms. And whenever the, uh, they were coming in, the priest came in, and he had the, the incense burning, and, uh, and it was really strong. And, uh, you know, it was, it was sort of a reverent moment. And all of a sudden, that, that little probably two-year-old in Mama's arms said, Kiwi! <laughs> and everybody, you could just see, I, I think probably the ones who were accustomed to that, probably that was a common thing. <laughs> may not, but the rest of us, we got so tickled. Um, I was in a business meeting one night at, at Grace Memorial, and just basically giving reports. And we had had Brotherhood Breakfast, and, and we had already had the service, so don't think that we did something uh, irreverent. 
uh, we, the business meeting was at the end. And this was at the end of the business meeting. And uh, so Sunday school stood up and, and different ones reported. We'd had brotherhood breakfast just the Sunday before. This was on Wednesday night. And I asked the, the brotherhood director, I said, uh, how many we, did we have for, uh, for breakfast Sunday morning? And he stood up and he said, hmm. And I said, okay, we had a thousand here. <laughs> Everybody laughed a little bit. And he said, no, a little lower. So I said, okay, we had a thousand here. And his wife got so tickled that it was over. And as it just sort of went across the congregation, you know, there wasn't but probably 50 there for the business meeting. But after that, I said, okay, you just dismissed. <laughs> we couldn't even gain our composure enough. We just left. And whenever you're not supposed to laugh, that's when it's the funniest. But God understands that. I want us to look at the one who laughs last, laughs best, and God always is the one to laugh last. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 17 then Abraham, this is God coming in, he's giving him the specifics of the covenant. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And he laughs. But he's laughing out of cynicism. He's laughing out of, out of not really able to put a handle on this. So he just simply could not believe that Sarah, being 90 years old, is going to have a child. Some who are in this room are 90 years old. What if you discovered you were going to have a child? Oh, there wouldn't be any laughter, would there? <laughs> I don't know that anybody here is 100, but if you were a husband and you were 100 and you found out that your wife, who was 90, is about to have a baby... I'd be laughing with cynicism too. <laughs> yeah, right. Let me help you out here, God. Because that ain't going to happen. So let me help you out. Verse 18. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael, y'all remember Ishmael, tried to take things into his own hand and it just, you know, sort of blew up on him. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you'll call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you, at this season next year. Abraham has waited for 25 years and now then the promise comes and he has become frustrated. And so what he's doing, what do we do when we become frustrated? We whine. Somebody asks, uh, you know, y'all, what do y'all normally drink for supper? And I say, we have wine at supper. Uh, we whine about what's not cooked right. We whine about the time we're having to eat, and we whine. That's what we do, isn't it? We whine. Saturday Night Live, I'm not a big fan, uh, but now, when it first came on, I was a kid and watched it. It was funny. But here a few years ago, they did have a skit, and it was the Weiner family. And uh, they just, even when people complain all the time, they just whine over everything. And uh, so family member girl said, I don't want to, we're having prunes for supper again. I didn't want prunes for supper, Mama. And the Mama whined and said, well, we didn't have anything else to fix because your Daddy didn't bring home any money this week. And the Daddy whined and said, well, I didn't bring home any money because you took so long in the bathroom and I was late for work. And the Mama said, well, I took so long in the bathroom because all we have to eat is prunes. We want, don't you think, oh my, wouldn't God get so tired of hearing us whine and complain? God just brings a truth to confront us. 
He is a merciful, a gracious, a holy, a sovereign God. And he loves us and he died for us in that while we were yet whining sinners. He loves us. Abraham was whining because whenever you are frustrated, sometimes you write God out of the equation and you try to fix the problem yourself. God says, no, we're going to do it my way. And he did. Next we have Sarah. Genesis 18 and verse 9 says, um, and this is, this is whenever, uh, it's a theophany, it's whenever pre-incarnate visit of Christ with two angels that come and he, and he announces to Abram that they're going to Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, so verse 9 says, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, There in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being all old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah denied it, however, saying, Oh, no, I didn't laugh. <laughs> for she was afraid. And he said, No, you did laugh. Sarah was laughing out of doubt. And I'm here to declare that God hears those laughs in our heart too whenever we doubt. And God says something wonderful to her here in verse 14. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? I don't know where you are right now in your walk. Maybe you are at a time of great, of great conviction. You've never come to know Jesus as your personal Savior and you see what God has done for you and that you want to have the joy in the Lord. You want to experience that merry heart. You want to have forgiveness. And today, that is offered to you. Today is an acceptable day of salvation. Come to know Jesus and He will put a laugh in your soul. He will give you something to have joy about. But some of you are believers and yet you are facing circumstances and situation that has robbed you of your joy. And you're living out, you're plodding through this life, and you don't feel like you have anything to laugh about. Well, let me take you to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham laughed out of cynicism. He just couldn't hardly fathom how this is going to happen. Sarah laughs because she's just plain old doubts God but she's afraid to admit it. Well, I'm here to tell you, this came true. When, when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, they had the son of promise, and his name was Isaac. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. Every time they called their little boy, they remembered, I didn't believe God, I laughed at him, but God had the last laugh and he laughed best, and he has fulfilled his promise. Believer, I'm here to tell you, if your heart is heavy this morning, if your circumstances seem more than you can handle, then don't laugh at with that cynicism, and don't doubt, but you come to that place to understand that God brings joy, and whatever you're going through, that God's going to see you through. And then you'll have the reminder that we have laughter. Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness.